first day, some Tuesday, or your birthday. Every day's a good day. Now let me tell you why. If you got air in your lungs, you got blood in your body, you are a child of God. Come on and sing it, somebody. On my best day, I'm a child of God. On my worst day, I'm a child of God. On the parking team here at the Gathering Church, we take our post seriously. Jesus is our message and people are our priority here on the parking lot. Rain or shine, snow or freezing temperatures, we will be here with joy to greet and celebrate every individual that pulls up to the gathering. We have all been there. We know the feeling of driving into church for the first time or returning to church, but laden with a heavy heart. And our goal is that when you turn into that parking lot, you will know you've made the right decision. You will immediately feel the love of Jesus through our enthusiasm, our warm smiles, and our waving hands and wands. You will know you are home, you are loved, and you are welcome, just as you are. Child of God on my worst day, I'm a child of God. Oh, every day is a good day, and you're the reason why. I'm so blessed, I'm so blessed. Got this heart beating in my chest. No, it doesn't matter about the rest. If I got you, Lord, I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. Hallelujah, I'm blessed. I'm so blessed. Okay. Some Tuesday or your birthday. Every day's a good day. Now let me tell you why. If you got air in your lungs, you got blood in your body, you are a child of God. Come on and sing it, somebody. On my best day, I'm a child of God. On my worst day, I'm a child of God. Oh, every day is a good day. You're the reason why. I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. Got this heart beating in my chest. No, it doesn't matter.
So I just wanna say thank you. I just wanna say thank you. Cause I know he be coming back twice in that state of a sight Cause I don't need no eyes to realize that I'm covered in the light, yeah You're not like me, you never change Oh my worst day is still the same And if you didn't do a thing, I still be here at your feet Cause your love is all I need so I just want to say thank you. I just want to hey say there. thank you. My name is John Mark Redwine, and I'm the lead pastor here at The Gathering Church. Let me welcome you. We're so honored to have you with us today. At The Gathering, one of our core values is family is our culture. And I hope that somebody made you feel like family today. I hope that you felt welcome, wanted, and seen in this place. One of the things that we have on a sign outside is at the gathering, you can belong before you believe. And that means that wherever you are in your faith journey, you have a place here. So engage with the worship today. Take some notes during the message. And let me encourage you to take the time to connect with someone today. Have a conversation. I think you'll be glad that you did. Enjoy the service, and I hope I get to connect with you soon. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Easter. Welcome to the gathering. Let's stand and worship together this morning. I'll praise the valley, I'll praise in the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure, I'll praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when
Amen. Amen. Well, hello. Welcome. It is Easter Sunday. We are here to celebrate the risen King Jesus. Is anybody filled with joy in this place today? I love that song that we just got to sing. It says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. It's directly from one of the Psalms that says the same thing. And the, the truth is that we have breath in our lungs because he gave it to us. And we get to pour that breath back out and praise to him. And I just wanna invite you to continue to do that as we continue in our service today. Before we get back to the worship though, there's a couple of quick things I wanna share with you. Um, as you came in, you had the opportunity to grab one of our programs. And at the bottom of that is our connect card. If you're new, uh, this is your first time with us, or if you haven't had a chance to connect with us yet, we would love for you to do that after the service. We'd love for you to take some time during the service, fill that out with some quick information, and afterwards you can take it to one of two places. Directly across the hall from the auditorium, you're gonna find our connections team, and this team is awesome at helping you take your next steps here at the gathering. Whether that's getting involved in the dream team, because we believe that serving is our calling, or it's getting connected into a small group because we know that life change happens in community, that team can help you take that step. We'd love to get to know you again if it's your first time with us. We've got something called the welcome party. So you can go out, take a left. You'll see a bright pink neon sign and there you uh, have the opportunity to meet some of our pastors and staff. We would just like to say hi to you, um, connect with you a little bit. We actually have a gift for you to say, thank you for being part of our community this weekend. We'd love to meet you there. We've got a couple of things coming up this week for everybody. If you wanna get a little more connected into the life of the church here at the gathering, we've got something coming up this Wednesday night called First Wednesday. If you've ever been to that, it's just a great opportunity for us to hang out, get to know each other. We just spend some time together um, connecting in community. We'd love to invite you to that. It's this Wednesday, April 3rd from 6 to 8 p.m. at Blue Ghost Brewing. We'd love to see you there. And again, if you wanna help, if you wanna get uh, connected further and take that next step, we've got something coming up next Sunday called Step One. This is an opportunity for uh, you to get to know a little bit more about the history, the vision and the values of the church, why we do the things that we do and how we've come to what we like to call our brand of crazy and how you can fit in that as well. It's directly following our 1030 service next week, right here. Uh, there's lunch and childcare provided. So if you just need a quick afternoon date, with your spouse and need somewhere to dump the kids, we got you. Come on up, come to step one. We'll feed you. It's gonna be an awesome time. And we'd love for you to come to that. Hey, like I said, just a few minutes, we're gonna continue into our worship time and I wanna encourage you, give it everything you got today. Man, we're here to celebrate who Jesus is and, and what he's done for us. But one of the ways that we worship is through our giving. We believe that generosity is a privilege because we serve a generous God who consistently blesses us with everything that we need and more. And it is our privilege to be able to respond in generosity in the same way. So if you'd like to partner with us financially in giving, you can do so in the ways behind me on the screen, or you can give in the boxes as you leave. And you gotta know that each of those gifts go into life-changing ministry here for this city. Man, we love this city and we would invite you to partner with us as we seek to reach it for the kingdom. Man, like I said, we're gonna continue in our worship together. And I wanna encourage you today. I don't know what you came in here with. I don't know what drew you here today. I don't know what, what, what's on your heart or what you're carrying, but I know who does. The Lord does. And we have an opportunity today to bring that to him, to lay it down. Psalms uh, 55, 22 says, cast your cares on him and he will sustain you. The righteous will never be shaken. We serve a God today that is never shaken. And he has allowed us to experience hope and experience freedom and experience life in his name. And we get to celebrate a risen savior today. So I would invite you to do that. Give him everything you have in this moment, this morning. Can I pray for you as we continue in the service? God, we love you. We come before you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for the victory that you have over sin, over death, over everything that holds us back from you, God. You have the victory. You are powerful, God. You are worthy of our praise and we give it to you in this time. God, I pray that everything we walked into here with, we would lay it down at your feet and recognize how much you love us and how you have called each of us to this place. God, would you pour out your presence on us this morning? We love you. We give you this time of worship. You're worthy of it all. We pray this on your name. Amen. Was six feet under 
One foot in the grave, no hope to be saved. I shouldn't be alive, but I'm a miracle child. Defied every diagnosis, and as close as it came, I can stand here and say, I'm a miracle child. Oh, death, where is your sting? My Savior's word is final. I am resurrected, but protected. I am a miracle child. If you're facing the odds, if you think you're beyond his saving, there's no life he can't please. Your wounds are too great. He's a miracle God yeah. Cause he shouldn't be alive His body was six feet under Three days in the grave But that's the world away Yeah, our God is alive Oh, death, where is your sting? My sin Testimony, you're the one who turns a dead in story to a living, breathing testimony. You're the living, breathing God of glory. I'm a living, breathing testimony. You're the one who turns a dead in story to a living, breathing testimony. The 
Son of God was laid in darkness A battle in the grave The war on death was waged The power of hell forever broke The ground began to shake The stone was rolled away His perfect love could not
I, I, was, I was worshiping this morning while they were rehearsing that song, just bawling my eyes out over here. You guys, we don't serve a God who is dead and in the ground and buried. We serve a God who is alive, resurrected, seated on the throne today. Over whatever's going on in your life, he is seated on the throne today. You can have a seat. My name is John Mark Redwine. I'm the lead pastor and Welcome to the Gathering Church. It's such an honor and a gift to have you with us here today. I hope that somebody made you feel at home in this place today. I hope that somebody made you feel welcome and wanted and seen in this place today. Man, we are just, we are honored that you chose to worship with us on your Easter Sunday. We've got a great day going on here, y'all. Worship's already been incredible. We got baptisms later in the service, and so... Uh, wow, man, we, we are so excited. Before I get into it, I've got a, I wore a blazer this morning just so I could pull something out of my inside pocket. You got one of these cards when you walked in, or I hope you did. And on the other side here is a QR code. If you'll click that with your phone, it'll bring you to a survey. Go ahead and take your phone out in church right now. You can access the Bible app later and click on this. And this survey is really, we know that we get our best opportunity to connect with you on Easter Sunday, that we get the most of you in the room at one time. And we just want to take this opportunity uh, to make sure that we can do everything we can to minister to you the very best that we can. So this will update some of your information, uh, but really it gives you an opportunity to let us know how we can be praying for you, where you are on your spiritual journey, and what kind of things you like to hear about when you come to church, what kind of sermons interest you, uh, all that kind of stuff. And so uh, it would be such a gift to us if you would fill out this survey for us today. Uh, and uh, you can do it. You got time right now. I'm about to do just promote the next series, so you're not going to miss anything. Uh, next week we begin a brand new series at the gathering called Jesus. And don't you know? G listen, what our first core value is that Jesus is our message, and for the next four weeks, Jesus is our message. Okay. Uh, our, our our goal over this next we're, today we're going to start talking about Jesus and the life of Jesus and and uh, the passion of Jesus and what his death and resurrection mean for us, and we're going to carry that story on next week in this series where we study who Jesus really is and what, what, what he means to us and what his life meant and all that kind of stuff. I really think uh, if you've ever wondered about Jesus or maybe you've followed him for a long time but you want to get to know him better, this next few weeks are really going to be for you. you be blessed by it. And so come on back next week and join us as we kick off that series called Jesus uh, and we're going to have a great time. Hey, let me pray for us. And we'll get into it this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for who you are, God. You are so good. We just honor and praise you with all of our praise today, God. You are the resurrected King. We thank you that your power knows no limitations, that you are sovereign over every circumstance, over every heart, over every person here today, God. We just lift up our arms and praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Easter Sunday. At the Gathering Church. Man, what a gift to be here with you. Um, today's sermon is titled, From Death to Life. From Death to Life. I want to talk about death and I want to talk about life a little bit today. The gospel message, the message of Jesus, has two crucial aspects to it. There is death and there is life. And both are very important. And so I want to just explain for a second why both of those things matter so much to us, especially on an Easter Sunday. First, we'll start by talking about death. Most of us are aware of the natural order of things, that most of life, all of life, everything in existence moves from life to death. Death has been a part of the story for a very long time, and death was going to be a part of Jesus' story from the very beginning of his ministry. In Matthew chapter 16, we see a conversation that Jesus has with his disciples. This happens maybe a year before his crucifixion, so well in advance. In uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. This always blows my mind. This is a verse in the Bible, okay? This is Matthew chapter 16, and this is happening a year before the crucifixion. And look at how plain the language is. It says that he explained to his disciples that they must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things 
and that he must be killed and resurrected on the third day. When you read Matthew chapter 16, it kind of gives me the impression that on Sunday morning of Easter, the disciples ought to have had some snacks sitting outside the tomb waiting to see what would happen. They're like day number three, I think. They're trying to figure the math out. These guys were fishermen, but but they'd be waiting. But no, that's not really how it goes because we just don't expect life to come from death. Everything that we know is that only death comes from life. We go on in this verse 22. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned back and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. He rebukes Peter harshly and says, you're only thinking about things the way that you understand things. You've got to understand that God is bigger than you know. Verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for me will find it. All this talk about death and life. Jesus is trying to help them understand that death was going to be a part of this story because death has been a part of this story for a very long time. In fact, in Genesis, we see death enter the story. In the very beginning, there was no death in the story. Man existed with God in the garden and there was only life because in the presence of God, there is only life. And that's where man dwelled. And God gave him this this little stipulation along with a warning and a punishment. In Genesis 2.16, said, The Lord commanded the man, You're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. God says, Man, there is a thing called death. And you will bring death into your world, into your life, if you make the only choice that I am asking you not to make. You see, God wanted to be in relationship with humanity. He wanted to receive love from humanity and to be able to give love from humanity. But in order for that relationship to work, there's got to be an element of choice. Because love without choice is abuse, and we don't serve an abusive God. And so he creates this opportunity for choice and You know, it's not a mystery what man chose. They eat from the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, and suddenly death enters the story. And now death is going to be a part of the story no matter what. God sends man and woman outside of the Garden of Eden into the world and says, in this world, there's sickness and there is death. Death is always going to be a part of the order of things here. Everything in this part of the world is moving from life to death. Death is a natural and expected part of the story had to be a part of the story. Jesus needed his disciples to understand death has to be a part of my story because death is a part of your story. And so Jesus enters into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And he comes, this is three years into his ministry, and he's been warning them about this kind of thing. Now for about a year, he's been plainly speaking to his disciples that this day is coming. But Jesus comes into Jerusalem to fanfare and shouts of Hosanna, And he comes in and it starts this week, this incredible week. And on Tuesday of that week, Jesus is teaching at the temple. And he stands in front of the temple and he says, I'm going to declare that this temple would be torn down and in three days I will rebuild it. The people standing there are confused and think he's talking about just the world's most efficient construction project. But in reality, he's trying to talk to them about death and life. Thursday night, Jesus has the Last Supper, and all these beautiful moments transpire while he's sitting there with them. I love the passages that tell us about the conversations that take place on Thursday night of the Holy Week. Jesus talks to his disciples all about life and all about death. He gives them instructions. He helps them be prepared. He helps them understand. He tells them the Holy Spirit is coming and that he's coming in power, and he's going to equip them to bring life to the people around them. Jesus gets up from the table after dinner is over, and he and his followers, they walk to the Garden of Gethsemane, which isn't far away. And at the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prays, and he prays about life, and he prays about death. He fears the death that awaits him. In fact, the Bible tells us that he's absolutely shaken by his fear for it, that he's so stressed out, that he's bleeding, he's sweating blood, and that he's asking God, take this away from me, this, this death that's coming, if there's any other way. But not my will, but yours be done. And he prays over his death, and then he prays over life 
for those who would follow him, for his disciples and for each one of us. And then that night, the the garden lights up as soldiers come into the garden carrying torches and being led by the disciple Judas Iscariot, who kisses Jesus as he betrays him, turns him over to the guards who arrest him and bring him before the high priest who would put him on trial. The priest and the Pharisees leveled accusations and false claims against Jesus. They're shouting at him. They're, they're, they're accusing him of this and that. And finally, after a, a while there, they take him to another trial before King Herod, the, the Roman puppet king of Judea. And he stands before King Herod, and King Herod levels more false accusations, and, and he, he accuses him of things. He asks him questions, and Jesus is then led from Herod's palace to the Roman governor's palace, Pontius Pilate. And Pilate is the only man in the, in the whole land who is able to issue a punishment of death, and death has to be a part of the story. So Jesus goes before Pilate early in the morning, and Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. He believed him to be an innocent man. He's asking him questions, and Jesus has been mostly silent until this moment, but he gives a few poignant answers that shake Pilate down to his core. He doesn't want to go through with this, and so he has Jesus taken away to be flogged, to be beaten with a, a, a whip 39 times with nine lashes on each end of the whip with bone and glass woven into it, and then hoping that that would satiate the people. John chapter 19 verse 1 says, Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns, forcing it onto his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again saying, Hail the king of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face and mocked him. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews, with Jesus now covered in blood, looking like death, look. I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. And when Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, here is that man putting his wounds on display. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for charge against him. Pilate consents to this sentence of death on Jesus, but he washes his hands of the death that would follow. Jesus is then led to a place where he's given a cross and made to carry it through the streets of Jerusalem as all the people look on and shout at him and mock him and spit on him and throw things at him until his wounds make it too difficult for him to carry the cross any longer. He can't go another step. And so the soldiers appoint a man named Simon of Cyrene to carry the cross for him, and together they make their way up to Golgotha, the place of the skull, a mountain outside or a hill outside of Jerusalem that we would come to know as Calvary. And at the top, he's placed on this cross. And he lays on it while his arms are lashed to the posts and then nails are driven through his feet and through his hands. And the cross is raised up between two thieves also sentenced to die that day. Each breath is excruciating as he pushes his wounded back up against the coarse wood. And for six hours, he's on that cross. He's mocked by the crowd. He's mocked by the guys that he's getting crucified with. He looks at the soldiers as they gamble for his clothes and says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. He cries out in agony, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he offers forgiveness and life to one of the thieves dying next to him. And he tells John, the only disciple who stayed and who's there to see this, to take care of his mother. He declares that he's thirsty. In Luke chapter 23, verse 43, it says, Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. All of life had been moving towards death for so long. Death came to be what we expected. In fact, our outlooks are shaped by the way that we understand death. Death surrounds us. Death becomes this fear that drives us. Death becomes this one horrible reality that all of us just accept. Except that the disciples didn't expect to see Jesus die in this way. This death, this horrible, horrific, violent death that Jesus suffered wasn't what they had in their plans 
But it was what Jesus had been telling them about all along. Because Jesus was trying to help them understand that the pathway was always leading towards death. It was going to be the Sabbath the next day, and it started at sunset. So his followers made quick work to get him down. You see, after Jesus said those words, he died, and the the Romans wanted to make sure he was dead, so they came over and pierced his side with a spear. And then his followers took his body off the cross and went to lay it in a tomb that was offered to him by Joseph of Arimathea, a follower of Jesus and a former Pharisee. On Friday and Saturday, Jesus stayed in that tomb, dead following the natural order of things. He had been alive, and now he was dead. It's the most famous story of death ever recorded. And in his teaching, and in the writings of the Gospels, and in the epistles, and throughout the Old Testament, there's so much emphasis on death. Why? Why is death such an important part of the story? Because death has always been the only direction we could walk in. And I don't mean to be a downer on your Easter Sunday, but all of life is this pathway towards death. Because of this broken world that we live in, sin created this one-way road towards death. Now, sin is one of those words we use in church, and if you're here today and you're not usually out of church, sin really just means when we make the choices that we know deep down in our heart, these are the things that push us farther from God. The things that are wrong, the the things that we do that are really just about me and what I want that make others hurt or make others suffer. The things that we do that just drive the distance between us and the God who is good and who is holy. The things that just move us farther and farther apart. God in the very beginning said you have just one choice that you can make that would take you towards death and it's this quest to be at the same level as God. To have the kind of knowledge and power that he has and ever since we've been making that same choice. We see that there's a God or somebody tells us that there's a God in heaven and we think I want to be in control of me. And so I'm going to make the choices that are going to make me feel like I have control over my life. But the reality that God was trying to help us understand even back in the garden and the one that we have to face every day that at some point in your life every person comes to a knowledge of is that the more that I make choices to try and move me to be in charge of my own faith, to have have, uh, my own destiny in my hands, the more that I make decisions that make me feel like I'm the one that's in control, the less control I really have. The more I feel empty, the more I feel like it's not enough, the more that I feel hurt, the more that I feel pain, and the closer I move towards death. Because the pathway that we chose only goes in one direction. It only moves towards death. And the Bible's been declaring that all along. It's this story after story of death and how our choices lead us towards death. And the cross and the events of Good Friday, they end in a death. Not just any death. Because something happens at this moment of death. It's not the same as every other death. There's this idea that exists in the Old Testament of something called atonement. An atonement was when I would do something wrong and the mistake that I made could be laid on something that had never done anything wrong. In the old world, this was done to pure lambs. They were sacrificed in place of the punishment that I deserved. And what the scriptures help us understand is that Jesus never sinned. He never made a mistake. He never did anything that should move him towards death. And when he went to that cross, he became this atoning sacrifice for you and I. So that when he died, death was satisfied for the first time in all of humanity. It tells us in the Gospels that at the moment that he gives up his spirit, this six foot thick curtain that separates the presence of God from the people of God and the temple of God was split from top to bottom. It tells us that people, that tombs opened up and people walked out of them and began to walk around because for the first time since Genesis chapter 3, death didn't have any rules to follow anymore. Things didn't make sense anymore because this death was so different than the death that had come before it. Jesus went into that tomb, though, and the disciples didn't understand that. They didn't know that. They just thought that hope went with him. 
They really believed that things were going to be different, that Jesus was going to change things. But just like that, he was dead. I mean, they saw him dead. His disciples scattered that night. Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus, he hung himself in a field, and the other 11 ended up in the upper room that they had been staying in, hiding, scared, really uncertain about what would happen next. What do they do now? This whole movement that they believed would be about life had now just ended in death, and so where should they go? What should they do? And they wait, and they go through the Sabbath while they're there. And then Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene and some of the other women went to the tomb to complete the embalming process now that they could. When they got there, this stone that had been sealed and guarded, it was rolled away and the tomb was empty. They couldn't believe it because all of life just moves in one direction towards death. The consequences of death are irreversible. Only Jesus had ever been able to change that and now he was dead. But they stood at the tomb and they looked inside and he wasn't there and sitting there instead. And honestly, probably pretty smug about the whole thing was an angel of the Lord. And the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And then go quickly and tell his disciples he's risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him. And now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy. It says in John's Gospel, chapter 20, verse 11, Mary stood outside the tomb crying, Magdalene, and as she wept, She bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. And at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But She didn't realize that it was Jesus because why would she? Most of the time, all death ends in death. But here he was alive. And he asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? And thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbanai, which means teacher. And in this place where there had been death, now there was life. And because of this moment, Everything is different. Because until this day, death always came from life. But now, because of this moment, because of this empty tomb, because of what we celebrate on Easter Sunday, life can come from death. Jesus said in his ministry that he is the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus said that he came that we might have life and have it in abundance. He was trying to explain all along that death was going to come in this story but that this was a new death, a temporary death, a death that would defeat death once and for all, a death that would make way for true life to come back into the story. And this life that we celebrate on Easter, this life that we long for, that every person on this earth is desperate to find the kind of life that makes you feel satisfied, the kind of life that until you've experienced it, you can't really explain it or even understand it. This life that you were born to live in, well, it can only come from death. It says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, For the wages of sin is death. Because of our sin, there's only one road for us to walk, death. But the gift of God, the free gift of God, is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So we get to move from death to life. And so, for you and me, What kind of death? Because life now springs from death. Life is what we have to look forward to on the other side of death. But for you and I, what kind of death leads to life? Well, first, it's death to sin. Death to sin. Peter wrote about this idea. 1 Peter 2, verse 22. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He he himself bore our sin in his body on the tree, the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And by his wounds, you have been healed. The call that God gives us is this call to repent. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus, you now have an option, an opportunity, a free gift to have your sins forgiven by his sacrifice. 
but it requires repentance. Jesus preached a common message in his ministry. We see in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, it says, From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Repent is a, is a word that just means to turn back. I was going in one direction, and I change, and I go in the other direction. The gospel message that Easter declares is that Jesus died on the cross so that we wouldn't have to keep moving towards sin and living in sin and choosing sin. Rather, because he has given us access to forgiveness of sin and grace for our sins, and because his Holy Spirit makes it possible for us to be free from our sin, we join him in death and see our sins die on the cross as well. Paul says it this way. In Romans chapter 6, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, would never die again. Death no longer has any dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. And so you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. We go to the cross with Jesus and see our sin and the decisions that we make that are all about me, 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 me. We let them die on the cross so that we could step in to a new kind of life. And the kind of life that we're offered isn't one that's temporary, fleeting, and fading. Instead, it's the kind of life that only continues to be refreshed in the Father. Second death is death to self. As if you want to have the kind of life that resurrected Jesus is offering you, there has to be another death. Death to self. What does that mean? Well, this world tells you to live for yourself. To look out for number one. To always put yourself first. It's a doggy dog world out there. To do whatever it takes to get yourself ahead. But in the kingdom of God, things work differently. To quit moving from life to death and to begin moving from death to life, we do things differently. We die to ourselves. We put others first. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. If he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. And take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus is preaching this before he goes to the cross. At this time, the cross is not something we wear on a necklace. It is just an instrument and a symbol of death. And Jesus says that if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself to the point of death so that you can live in life. Jesus also says that in his kingdom, whoever wants to be first has to be last. And whoever is last would be first. Paul said in Galatians 3.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and who gave himself for me. If you want the kind of life that you were created to experience, you have got to stop living for yourself. The consistent call that Christ gives us is for us to turn all of our attention towards him. He doesn't want a part of you. He doesn't want a part of your life. You can't keep one foot on the pathway to life and one foot on the pathway to death. The call of Christ is a call for all of you, all of it, everything you are. He wants you to die to yourself, to die to your ambitions, to die to your dreams, to die to the things that you think you want your life to be about, and instead to live for him, to live for his ambitions, his dreams, the purpose he has for you, and the only purpose that would ever satisfy you is the call that he's placed upon you. If you want to die, if you, I mean, if you want life, if you want to move from death to life, well, you have to die to yourself. You have to change your priorities. Do the things you give your time, your money, your energy towards, do they, the, the things that you give yourself to the most, do they build your, you up or do they build up the kingdom of God and his purposes? Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God our Father. We die to ourselves. And then finally, it's death to the world. 
death to the world. We were in a series just last week called Binge the Bible, season two. We're going through the Bible at kind of a 30,000 foot view, looking at the story of scripture. And we just finished reading through all these stories in the Old Testament that tell us about how all of humanity, really in the story since the garden until now, has tried to do this balancing act where we keep one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God. Well, I want the things that the world tells me that I should want. I want fame. I want riches. I want power. I want position. I want people to love me. I want all of these things. But I also want to go to heaven, so I'm going to keep one foot, you know, I'm going to make sure I hit that monthly church service to make sure that everything's okay. That's not the call of Christ. In order to partake in the life that he gave us, that he lives, that he offers us, we have to partake in the death as well and die to the world around us. Until we die to ourselves and die to our sin... We can't understand what it really means to be made complete in this presence of God. God calls us into relationship with him, and it's meant to be an exclusive relationship. He says that a commandment, have no other gods before me. And in return, he offers us access to himself. And that's huge because that's what we were made for. We're made out of flesh and spirit, according to Genesis 2. And that spirit in us is made from God and could only be completed from God. But in order to experience that, we have to die to the world around us. But we don't like to. And so we try to fill the void that's left by our need for God with all the trappings of this world. Money, sex, power, people. Any pleasure we can find and it's never enough. You will never find the life you're looking for if you try to follow God but keep your hands in this world. You've got to die to the world. John says... Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, it's not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away because all of the world only moves from life to death, along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever because only God can move you from death to life. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. And so we die to the trappings of this world. And when we do that, and when we've done that, then we can fulfill the promise of Easter. Then we can know what it means to move from death to life. We can defy the pattern of life. The rest of the world follows and move from death to life. Ephesians chapter 2 says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and your sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming age he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God had prepared in advance for us to do. At the end of that passage, Paul says that there is life for us after we experience this death, even in this world, and it is a life beyond anything you could ever imagine. And so real quick, here's what life looks like in Christ Jesus. First, it's life as a disciple. Life as a disciple. Sometimes we get it in our heads that Christianity is just raising your hand one Sunday morning in church. And then from there, it's, that's it. You got it. You're taking care of. Everything's good. You, you should be a good Christian now. You got to make sure, you know, wear your blazer on Sunday morning. You know, you, you, you got it figured out now. And we, we make it our mission as followers of Jesus to understand that it's about more than a moment, but that following Christ is about being a disciple, letting us understand how to be with Jesus and become like Jesus and do what Jesus did. It's this lifelong journey, this lifelong 
pursuit. You know, the followers of Jesus, these 12 guys, they were with Jesus every day for three years, and most of them still had no idea what was going on when Jesus was crucified. It takes time. Je- Jesus is arrested, and there's one of the guys commits an act of violence so serious that Jesus has to heal somebody while he's being arrested. Even the disciples of Jesus took time. You can't expect this to be a 12-week course or to go to one small group and you should be discipled. And why is this so hard? How come I'm still struggling? Why is it that I feel like I'm taking steps forward and steps back all the time? Because you're called to life as a disciple. It's a journey. You begin to know him more and more each day. And you, you just try to move forward and to learn about him and to become like him. And to get closer and closer to who, who he's called you to be. It's a lifelong pursuit. But it's a good one. Second is you've been called to a life with purpose. See, the difference between the life we live without Jesus and the life we live with him is simple. It's purpose. We spend our whole lives searching for purpose. Trying to find it in a million different outlets in a million different ways. Everybody's looking for purpose, for meaning. And what we, what we discover is the things that we think are going to give us purpose and meaning. We get to that mountaintop and all we see is another mountaintop. That it wasn't enough. That it just left us feeling like there's got to be more. It left us empty. And that is because you have a purpose in Jesus' name. You were created with one. And you won't feel whole until you know what that purpose is. You won't feel whole until you are living in the purpose he made you to experience. Ephesians 2.10. We just read it. It says, you are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. He's always had a dream in mind for you. And when we move from death to life, we get to find out what that is and experience it. Your purpose is simple. It's to glorify God and serve people. And if we can do that, we can know real peace and real satisfaction and real joy. And finally, and this is the big one, the life that he's calling us to is a life everlasting. It's a life where death has no more power. Jesus gained the final victory over death. Death doesn't have power over you anymore in Jesus' name. Because the tomb is empty today, Jesus calls us to continually move from death to life. In Matthew 5, 24, he says, Truly, truly I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, whoever, not whoever's good enough, not my favorite ones, not whichever ones figure out the language to use and the things to say. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but he has passed from death into life. The assurance the scriptures give us is that because of this Easter Sunday moment, Jesus came out of that grave, not alone, but with the keys to death and Hades in his hand. That he came to bring us into that kind of life. And because of Easter Sunday and his mastery over death, because he reversed the natural order of things, and now we move from death to life, there is going to come a day where you are going to open your eyes to the sound of trumpets. And you're going to be called into his presence and stand before him, the one who made you. And because of the life that you lived, because you chose death, because you chose to die to yourself, to die to your sin, to die to the world around you and pursue his kingdom, he's going to look at you and find your name written in his book of life and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your master's rest and be with him and in his presence forever and all eternity. And if you're in here today and you're ready to make that decision, if you're ready to stop moving in one direction only and just stop moving towards death, but if you're tired of the death, tired of the fear, tired of the pain, tired of the endless suffering, now listen to me, I gotta tell you something, I gotta give you a disclaimer. Jesus moves you from death to life, but that doesn't mean this life is without suffering and without pain. Believe me, I know. There is pain and suffering when you follow Jesus. In fact, he guarantees it. He says, if I was beaten and crucified, that's what they did to me. What do you think they're going to do to you? If the world hated me, how do you think it's going to feel about you, my disciples? He said, in this world, you will have trouble. Then he says, take heart, for I have 
overcome the world. And even though we face difficult days, we do it with a hope that we've never had before. And if you're ready to receive that hope, that living hope, that eternal hope today, every head bowed, every eye closed, it just begins with the belief, the belief, the confession, and the beginning of a conversation. Pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me for my sin. Forgive me for trying to do this all on my own, for I know now that I need you. Lord, I I no longer want to move towards death. I choose life in Jesus' name. I believe in you. I believe in your resurrection, and I believe that you want to resurrect me. All that I am, from this day forward, I am yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Would you stand up with me? If you just made that decision, I want you to know that all of heaven is rejoicing in Jesus' name today. And if you made that decision, we want to be able to respond to let you know. We believe that church is about more than Sunday. That it means being a part of a family. We say family is our culture at the gathering. It means being a part of a journey that you don't have to walk alone. You now get to walk it alongside a family of believers who are going to help you in the hard days and celebrate with you in the good days. And so we want to begin that journey together. Let us know that you made a decision by filling out a Connect card. and You can hand that in at the Connection Center. And we've got some resources for you there today. Or you can let us know on the survey. When you fill out the survey, you can mark it there. And uh, and and we'll follow up with you in the next couple days and give you some next steps that you can take. Uh, listen, if your first step is baptism. And if you want to be baptized today, you can be. You can go right now out. There's some volunteers in the back. You look for Cindy. And she's got some clothes for you to be baptized in. We've got a towel for you. We would love to see you take your next step today. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But if you're in here today and, uh, and you want to take a next step, you can go to that Connection Center. You can fill out the Connect card or join us next week at step one. Well, now we're going to do communion. Communion is an Easter tradition going back 2,000 years in an unbroken chain. It connects us to every generation of believers since that night in the upper room. Jesus knows that he's being arrested that night, knows he's being crucified the next day, and everything that he does on that night, Thursday night, carries weight. And he's having this Passover meal with his followers, and it's this ancient covenant about a promised land that they're celebrating. And Jesus uses this moment to make a new covenant, a covenant about not just a promised land, but his promise of life. And so he passes around the bread. If you want to peel back this first layer you'll find a little piece of styrofoam, which represents the bread. It's edible. Uh, He passes the bread around and he breaks it, hands it to his disciples and says, this is my body, which is broken for you so that you could be made whole. Heavenly Father, we thank you for letting your perfect body be broken for me, for taking upon yourself my suffering and my shame so that I could be made whole and be yours and move towards life in Jesus' name. Amen. Next, uh, and I struggled first service, so Cindy gave me instructions today. You gotta break the bottom and then you can peel back the next layer. You guys probably all knew that, but if you'd have been here first service, it took me about 10 minutes to get there. I was looking for a knife. I was like, we got to open this thing. Jesus passed the wine around, and he said to his followers, this is my blood. This represents my blood, which would be poured out for you, the perfect blood of the perfect lamb, so that my sins could be forgiven. Heavenly Father, we thank you for becoming the sacrifice for all mankind, for satisfying my debt through your blood, that through your blood I might be made whiter than snow. We worship you today. We remember you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now be careful what you do with this if you're wearing a white sport coat. Put that down. Now we're going to celebrate baptism. Now, baptism is a crucial moment in the church because we believe baptism is a command. Jesus did this when he was stepping out of his regular life and into a life devoted to ministry. He went to be baptized to symbolize this great change in direction that he was taking. As Jesus is baptized, the Bible tells us that heaven opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And God said three things to, the, to Jesus that the people could hear. And he said, this is my son whom I love 
with whom I am well pleased. And today we celebrate baptism and we choose to be baptized because we are acknowledging that those promises God declares over us as well. We are his children adopted into sonship and we know that he loves us and cares for us because of the glory of the cross. And we know now that he is proud of this moment that we declare our decision before all of his people to turn our lives towards him. And so here's what I want. When someone goes down into the water, the Bible tells us that at this moment, all of heaven is filled with shouts of praise. Can we make it sound like heaven in this room today? When somebody gets up out of that water, we're going to worship. Let me pray and we'll worship through baptism. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are, God, that you are a God not of death, but the God of life. And that because of you and through Jesus and because of what happened today, because of the empty tomb, we get to choose life and not just life, but life in abundance. And so we honor you. We worship you. We fall on our face in worship before you today, God. We thank you for the life you've given us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
God, can we lift up a shout of praise in this place? Let's go. We have seen people move from death to life. Man, that is what we're here for. That is why we are here, to see people move from death to life. And I got to tell you, it's not too late. I'm not going anywhere. That hot tub's not going anywhere for a while because it's going to take a minute to, uh, to, to train it. I'm serious. So if you're still here and you're like, man, I wish I had, don't leave this place wishing you had. Come, come, we're ready for you. We would love to see you take that next step today. But hey, as we get ready to head out here, man, I wanna encourage you. We don't serve a God that's one and done. We don't serve a God that calls us to a moment. We serve a God that calls us to a lifestyle, to a life, a journey with him. Man, I hope that we can help you take your next steps on that journey, whatever that looks like. But I do wanna invite you once again, come join us this Wednesday night at Blue Ghost. We would love to see you there. We'd love to just hang out with you, get to know you. And if you wanna take a next step here at the Gathering Church, make sure you show up for step one next week. Don't forget, it's gonna be awesome. Don't miss it. Man, we wanna help you understand that culture that Pastor John Mark talked about. Family is our culture. And we know that you can find family here. There's a place for you. Man, I love you guys. I love worshiping with you. Have a great week and have a great Easter. We'll see you next time.